All right, Alexander, let's uh, do a do an update on Ukraine. It's that time of the week to do an update on Ukraine. What's going on on the ground? Of course, we're going to talk about Bakhmut, but we have other other uh, areas as well that we could discuss. Um, Kupiansk is is one area, uh, Ugladar, perhaps, and then let's uh, talk about some of the the politics or the or the geopolitics in and around the conflict in Ukraine. So let's begin as we always do with the situation on the ground. Yeah, well, the the important thing is that for the first time now, um, Russian officials are talking about a cauldron having developed in Bakhmut. In other words, a cauldron is in effectively a kind of encirclement. It means that Ukrainian troops in Bakhmut, and not just in Bakhmut, but in the area around nearby, that they're effectively trapped. Um, and... It, the, the most comprehensive explanation of this came from a, a Russian official called Jan Gagin, who is an official of the government of the Donetsk People's Republic. Um, Bakhmut, of course, is a town in Donetsk region, so you know he's presumably well informed. And he is saying that it is, it is a cauldron, and he's saying that 10,000 men are trapped inside this cauldron. Now, this cauldron may grow, because we're still in an evolving situation. But anyway, that's, that's what he's saying. And the reason it's happened is because the Russian forces, and I think we should say the Wagner organization forces, forces have now reached the two roads that have been leading into Bakhmut. They've apparently made, gained more ground overnight towards the northern road, which is a at a, they've reached, almost reached, a place called Khomovo, where this road passes through. They've been just a few kilometres from that road, I mean, within visual sight of it for some time, but they're now almost there. So they've almost cut that road. But even if they haven't quite reached the road itself, because they're so close to the road, any trucks or vehicles that try and move up and down they can get shot, they can be shot at, they can be fired at by t guns, artillery, mortars and anti-tank missiles. And the same is now also true of, a, of another more southerly road. So the roads into Bakhmut are cut. Now, a cauldron doesn't mean that one or two individuals can't, you know, go backwards and forwards. It's not, you know, like a medieval siege necessarily. So we're not quite at that start, that sort of situation yet. But if you're talking about groups of soldiers who can be tracked by drones, who can be surveyed, they can be uh, attacked. And I'm now starting to see increasing numbers of pictures, which are said to be from Bakhmut, and which I believe are from the Bakhmut area, which show movements of Ukrainian soldiers, attempts, attempted attempts by Ukrainian soldiers to leave Bakhmut, uh, sometimes in trucks and such things. And almost immediately when they try to, they get shelled. And, well, some of the pictures are very distressing. So it is, according to Gagin and a number of other Russian officials now, it's now, it's now a cauldron. And cauldrons can take a long time, gradually the Russian practice is to heat up the cauldron, more artillery fire, more pressure on the soldiers trapped inside it. It's psychologically very difficult for soldiers who find themselves in a cauldron, by the way. Um, you gradually heat it up. It can take a while for the cauldron to sort of boil and for resistance within it to collapse. But provided the cauldron is maintained, provided the Ukrainians don't succeed either in breaking out or breaking in, by the way. And Gagin raised the possibility that there might be an attack by the Ukrainian army to break through from Chasofya. But, you know, we'll talk about that in a moment. But unless, unless that happens, it becomes only a matter of time before the forces within the cauldron are defeated and the battle ends. So another 10,000 men already trapped 
perhaps more to be trapped fairly soon. But that's where we are as of this morning, according to Russian reports and Russian claims in this battle of Bakhmut. Okay. Um, I think what you said about perhaps some sort of uh, of an attempt by Ukraine to break through the cauldron is is what they're discussing, actually, because I did see a document floating around a Telegram that was translated, which claims that uh, that Alensky held uh, a meeting with uh, uh, Sirsky and uh, Zaluzhny, and um, they allegedly, Alensky asked, what, what should we do with Bakhmut? And uh, they all agreed, the commanders agreed that they should continue to, uh, to operate and to reinforce Bakhmut. They shouldn't pull out, they shouldn't move away, they should continue to to do what they're doing in uh, in Bakhmut. So it does sound like the decision has been made to uh, to try and create some sort of breakthrough, even though they're not phrasing it like that. They're phrasing it as if there is no cauldron and we're just going to continue to hold on to the city, which brings me to the fact that the narrative has become uh, Bakhmut does not hold strategic significance, but is symbolic. That's now what you're hearing from not only uh, the Ukraine military, but also the collective West media. And the Ukraine mi military has done an excellent uh, uh, job of exchanging time for territory so that they could prepare for the spring counter -offens offensive. What do you make of, of all of right, look, these narratives? Lots of things to say. First of all, I think you're absolutely right. I think that the Ukrainians, um, <laughs> well, they're now in a situation where their only real option, if we are in a cauldron type situation, which I believe we are, the, their only real options are two: either abandon those 10,000 men in, in Bakhmut, assuming it is 10,000 men, but I think that looks like a realistic number to me. Either abandon them. And you know, that's a significant force. If we go back to the fighting in Kherson region, which was going on in the autumn, the entire Russian force that was defending Kherson region, west of the Dnieper, numbered 25,000 men. So Ukraine, in a single place, would lose more than a third of that number. So it's a significant force. Either you forget about those men, you abandon them to their fate, you tell them to surrender to the Russians or fight on till you know that you're dead. Either you do that, or if they can't break out, and I don't believe they can break out. By the way, I mean how how would they do that? It's very difficult to see how such a thing is possible. If they can't break out, then logically you've got to try to break in, and there are lots of reports now that. Um, Ukrainian forces are accumulating in Chasofya. There was even a report a few days ago that uh, these Leopard 2 tanks that Poland gave to Ukraine, some of them have been rushed to Chasofya. That's not confirmed, by the way. But there are some reports to that effect. And it's, I think, more likely than not that at some point over the next couple of days we'll be seeing a Ukrainian attack from Chasofya. Now, let's just think through what that means, though, because in order to carry out an attack like this, with any prospect of success, you have to commit good troops. I mean, you can't ask reservists who've just been called up to carry out an attack of this nature, especially in the face of m massive Russian artillery concentrations. So you're going to commit your some of your best troops to a breakthrough attempt towards Bakhmut in an area, as I said, where the Russians dominate with artillery. So you're going to sacrifice some of your best troops. If you're going to use Leopard 2 tanks to do it, and you've only had a couple of weeks training on these things, so you haven't really mastered them properly, well, highly likely you're going to lose some of those as well. Now, the Wall Street Journal has just published a long article. Uh, I don't agree with every part of it, but it says that Ukraine has suffered enormous losses trying to hold on to Bakhmut. Um, and 
it's already lost some of its best units, some of its best brigades have been destroyed in the fight in Bakhmut. Trying to launch this kind of breakthrough attempt, which, to be honest, its prospects of success do not look great. Trying to launch a kind of breakthrough attempt is simply going to throw away the lives of more of Ukraine's best troops after those that have been lost already. And uh, the Wall Street Journal says that the losses that Ukraine has suffered in Bakhmut of some of its best troops have already diminished the prospects of the much-talked-about spring offensive. And if they're going to send, throw in more of their best troops into a breakthrough attempt in Bakhmut and even throw in some of their Leopard 2 tanks into this attack in Bakhmut, then they're reducing the prospects of that spring offensive even more. So I think that's what they're going to do. Now, two quick things. I'm only going to discuss very briefly this story, you know, about Bakhmut, not really strategically important, all of those sort of things. Well, I think we've talked about it many times. We've talked about how it's at the hub of the communication system, how it links together all the various Ukrainian defences in Donetsk, how it's... Um, effectively controls the high ground that um, will make it possible if the Russians capture the high ground for the Russians to shell the next Ukrainian defence line, the one around Kramatorsk, Slavyansk, <coughs> Konstantinovka. So uh, we don't shouldn't pay too much attention to that. But if we're talking about Zelensky, Zelensky's position and the fact that he's had this meeting with Zeluzhny and Tsirsky. Um, there's no doubt at all, to my mind, that all three of them are deeply implicated in this decision to cling on to Bachmann. <clears throat> Clearly, it was seen as too important to give up. Perhaps they should have accepted a few weeks ago that it had become undefendable, but they decided to fight on for grim death, and that's I think, what collectively they are doing. But I'm going to say this. Zelensky needs to be careful because he's being, he's being um, positioned now as the scapegoat if Bakhmut does indeed fall. There's been an article in Bild Zeitung, which is one of the big mass circulation... It is the biggest mass circulation tabloid in Germany, which repeats the story. And this is now appearing in a Western media outlet, repeats the story that Zeluzhny weeks ago advised Zelensky to pull back from Bakhmut and that it was Zelensky who decided to fight on there to the end. I I'm becoming increasingly sceptical about those reports. I think that Zeluzhny and Sirsky, as they were fully on board with the decision to fight for Bakhmut. But I think what they're doing is that they're actually, as I said, positioning Zelensky as the scapegoat. So if and when there is a failure in Bakhmut, they will blame him. They will blame Zelensky. And he will be blamed. And, of course, there's already protests about this, apparently, amongst many Ukrainian soldiers. Many Ukrainian families are very distressed by what's happening. And, of course, if there's a disaster, a debacle at Bakhmut, well, you know, Zelensky is the person who's carrying the target on his back now. Yeah. Uh, and anything else happening in, in um, Kupiansk, Kuruglidad? Yeah. And uh, also, real quick before you answer that, uh, the Russians are, are aware, obviously, the Russian military is aware that Ukraine is going to, to perhaps... Uh, try to break through this cauldron from uh, Chasovyar. So, I mean, this is not going to catch the Russians by surprise, and I imagine they've prepared uh, for this, or you, you would think that they're prepared for this. I think, that's, of course, they know about it, and, I'm, and they'll, they'll be talking about it. And, and the, I will say <clears throat> that, you know, we've just been hearing more comments from Yevgeny Prigozhin, who is who claims to be the head of the Wagner organization. It's important always to stress that Prigozhin does not command the Wagner forces. He's a 
pure civilian. He's never been involved in the military in his life. He's not served in it. He's not a trained officer. The people who command the Wagner forces are Russian officers, <laughs> you know, ex-Russian officers who've been assigned to command the Wagner troops. So I think that's an important thing to say. But anyway, he's going out, he's made another colourful video. He says that he's not getting, his men are not getting the artillery, uh, the ammunition that they need. It's clearly all these ongoing rows that are happening. It's not affecting you, Wagner organisation advances in Bakhmut. But I suspect that what he wants, he wants more and more ammunition, partly because he wants to emphasise again how important his force is, but also because he needs that ammunition to parry that Ukrainian counterattack, which is coming. And I think that the Russians obviously understand this, and I'm sure that they will do what they can to try to prevent this breakthrough attempt from succeeding. I mean, the Russians have experience of this kind of thing. They've dealt with cauldrons many times. They know all the things that cauldrons involve, and I think that's absolutely correct. I think they will be prepared for it, and they are preparing for it, and um, I think the Ukrainians, for their part, have had little time to prepare this offensive. So um, if the more time that's spent, though, uh, the stronger the Russian defences will become, the harder the cauldron will get. So the Ukrainian time window is small. So that's, the, that's what I would say about that. There's lots going on in other parts of the battlefront. Before you answer the lots, uh, let me ask you one yes. more question before you answer yeah. the lots. Does this remind you of the Baltsovo from it's 2015, which prompted, which prompted Merkel to then call... Putin and basically well, the well, it's minutes. very, very interesting that you mentioned Balsavo because um, Jan Gagin, who was the um, Russian official that I was quoting earlier, well, um, he actually talks about Balsavo. He actually makes precisely the comparison that um, you've just made. You just said he's he said, and I, I, I'm going to I'm going to quote him actually now. These are. These are um, these are his specific words. Um, a new cauldron has formed in the area of the city, which can be compared with Dubalsava. <laughs> so you know it reminds me of Dubalsava. It's obviously reminded you of Dubalsava, and Gagin, who is, as I said, an official of the Donetsk People's Republic, and who is um, a um, somebody who therefore would be extremely familiar with the Battle of Dubalsava of 2015, where there was exactly this kind of cauldron. Well, he's making exactly that comparison which you have just made. And of course, this time, there's not going to be a Merkel flying off to Moscow, meeting with Putin, uh, uh, cobbling together the Minsk agreement in order to rescue the troops in Dubalsava. This time, that's not going to happen. But it's exactly the scenario that you've just outlined. And you see that even a, a Donetsk official is saying that very thing that you just said. And, of course, counterattacks like the kinds that Ukrainians might be thinking about, well, that will make the parallels with Dubalsava even greater. Now, if I could just talk about what's going on, because there's lots going on in other battle places. I mean... Um, Clearly now, I think there's, I have little doubt that the Russians are seriously planning to retake at least Kup, that part of Kupiansk, which is east of the Oskol River. Now, Kupiansk was the main, the most important town that Ukraine captured during its Kharkov um, offensive of the autumn. I mean, it captured, if you remember, Balaklia, then Izium, and then eventually they got to Kupiansk. And it was when they captured Kupiansk that that opened the way for the further uh, uh, Ukrainian attacks towards Svatovo, Kremenaya, the capture of Liman, all of those things. Well, the Russians now seem to be pushing hard, both towards Kupiansk. They are almost there now. They're literally on the outskirts. They're taking the various villages. They're preparing, obviously, on advance on Kupiansk itself. 
And at the same time, they've also been pushing forwards towards uh, from Kremenaya. They've been pushing the Ukrainians back, back. And the reason they're able to do that is because Ukrainian, the Ukrainian military is absolutely folk, absorbed now on this crisis in Bakhmut. So they're sort of pulling reserves to try to deal with this situation in Bakhmut. And at the same time, they're coming under all this pressure from the West, the Western powers, to launch their offensive in Zaporozhye. And they're trying to concentrate forces to launch that offensive as well. So in the meantime, Kharkov, that whole region, is starting to look increasingly vulnerable. And the Russians are pushing, because if they take Kupiansk, or at least Kupiansk, east of the Oskol River then the whole position that Ukraine achieved through its successful offensive in Kharkov region begins to go into reverse. Now, there's been fighting elsewhere. The Russians have been bombing with their aircraft Avdeyevka, which is this main area close to Donetsk city. That's where the bulk of the Ukrainian forces in Donetsk city are concentrated. There's now... Lots of maps and information coming out that the Russians are methodically demolishing Ukrainian defences in Avdeyevka and that they're again starting a kind of pincer movement around Avdeyevka. So it looks like we have a second Bakhmut starting to emerge in Avdeyevka. This is probably at an earliest, well, we, you know, we've still got weeks of fighting ahead of us there, but we're starting to see that battle take that kind of direction. And it seems to me that the same is happening further south in Vugladar. Now, the Russians, back in, August, uh, in January, um, launched an attack on Vugladar. Um, they were, at one point, thinking that they might be able to take it very quickly. Ukraine, again, rushed troops to try to hold Vugladar, taking them from the Kremenaya region that we've just been talking about, uh, that prevented the Russians capturing Vugladar. And I get the sense that what the Russians are now doing in Vugladar is doing exactly what they're doing in Bakhmut and in Avdeyevka. They are setting up the situation for another meat grinder there. They're bringing up artillery, they're shelling the Ukrainian troops, they're shelling the uh, roads, that lead into Vugladar, they're bringing in reinfor their own reinforcements, they're gradually creating another meat grinder. And you can start to see Russian tactics. So they find these places, Avdeyevka, Bakhmut, Vugladar, possibly, in the end, Kupiansk, places which Ukraine feels it must defend if it's going to hold on to eastern Ukraine at all. The result is that Ukraine reinforces its positions there and the Russians are able to engage these Ukrainian forces with their massive artillery concentrations and it becomes an attrition battle. And, of course, that works exactly to the Russian plan, which is, as the Russians have said, to grind the Ukrainians down. Yeah. OK, uh, how about from the political, geopolitical. We've had more statements from Olaf Schultz after his meeting with Biden. He gave an interview to CNN. He then went back to Germany, met with Ursula uh, von, der, von der Leyen, and he warned China again, don't you don't you send weapons to, uh, to Russia or else. Uh, we've had some, uh, some articles, I believe, from the Wall Street Journal yeah. claiming that, uh, that Biden may not be so confident in um, in Ukraine's victory and has kind of freaked out the Baltic nations, though they don't get into the details as to what Biden might have said, which has which have freaked them out. And uh, there was an article a couple of days ago from National Review, which talked about how Biden's trip to Poland and Kiev was didn't do him any favors. And he's really just mumbling about taking on uh, Russia with your typical uh, tropes and slogans and mantras and stuff like that, but he hasn't really put together a plan. 
though National Review still believes that Ukraine will win and they'll take Donbass and Crimea. But if you dig, dig deep into the article, you understand that uh, people are, are nervous because there really is no plan in place. Anyway, um, exactly. I just mentioned well, the, some articles that I that caught my attention. I, I don't know if there's anything that you I, I did. I did. Like, I did, I did read that. Or, or various yeah. articles. I, I, I did read that article. By the way, I think it was in National Interest. But it, when I read it, <laughs> when I read that article. Was about, it in National Interest? Yeah, one yeah, of those. Yeah, one of those. Yeah, one of those. I'll find the screenshot. When, yeah, yeah. I'll find the when, I yeah. Read it, when I read it, I have to say, I did make me wonder whether perhaps they've been watching your video <laughs> about Biden strip to uh, Ukraine and uh, Poland because essentially it was the video that you made at the time and it's all the same talking points. I mean, here he is, empty rhetoric, <laughs> mumbling wet rhetoric and a man completely without a plan. And I mean, you know, obviously, you know, you have all the ritual things about you know, Ukraine winning. But it seemed to be, I seem to be uh, uh, reading talking points that you'd already made. I mean, it was a weird sense of deja vu. So, I mean, that's all I'm going to say about that particular article. But um, let's talk about Olaf Scholz. So he comes, he goes to Washington, he meets Biden. Very unclear what the two men said to each other, because along comes Olaf Scholz. I have to say, my impression of him is that he's treading water. <laughs> I mean, he gives all these interviews, he gives all these comments, and he's not telling us anything. I mean, he's just repeating the same things that have been said now um, so many times um, in so many places by Western leaders. There's, again, absolutely nothing new there, just as there was nothing new with what Biden was saying. Um, Schultz wasn't saying anything. You know, China mustn't send weapons to Ukraine. Chinese have said they're not going to send weapons to Ukraine. Um, we're going to stay, stick with Ukraine. Um, he did say, the only thing he did say was that the war was in stalemate and that this, was be, this would be bad for Ukraine. But he didn't come up with any plan or any ideas about what to do. And so, as I said, it struck me very much that he was treading water. He went to Washington, as we discussed in a previous video. There was no press with him. There was no German media with him. There was no press conference. So, you know, one does wonder what these two people talked about when they met, because I didn't really see very much substance out of this, you know setting up a Rheinmetall uh, 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 factory <laughs> in uh, 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 Ukraine to build Leopard 2 tanks. I mean, is that, I mean, a fantastic, I mean, a grotesque idea. But I mean, is that really, is that what they talked about? Um, Biden telling, you know, um, Schultz, you know, you must increase your ammunition production. <laughs> I, mean, is, I mean, was that, was that all they said? Because, you know, I'm struggling to find anything of substance in any of Schultz's words. So something must have been talked about, but I've no idea what it was. And it doesn't seem as if it was anything that's going to change the course of the war anytime soon. So that's all I can say about Schultz. The Wall Street Journal article about what Biden said to the East Europeans, I think is the most interesting one of all. And again, just like you, you, I couldn't really make out what the substance was and what it was exactly that Biden did say to the East Europeans. But it does seem that they came away, uh, they were utterly freaked out. They took it very badly and that they concluded that he has doubts that Ukraine can win the war. Now, given that to the extent that we can find out any kind of logic behind Biden's visit, to Europe, to Poland and Ukraine at all, it was to shore up support for the war. If Biden managed to demoralise the East Europeans, then it would seem that he did the opposite. But anyway, one way or the other, it doesn't seem as if he came across as a confident and strong leader, full of optimism about the way the course of the war is going. On the contrary, it suggests that behind all the bluster, you know, there is gathering doubts and growing concerns and real worries that things are not going according to plan. And it seems that at some way or in some manner that got communicated and it didn't go very well. 
Let me just go back to Schultz. I mean, I, I suspect that the true purpose of the Schultz visit was to try to sort of come up with some kind of negotiation strategy. And um, Helm has written a good piece, actually, on Dancing with Bears about why the proposals that Blinken and co. have been floating, I mean, they, re they really won't fly. And how desperate the Western powers are now to come up with a negotiating strategy. But it's clear that they're out of ideas and that they really don't know what to do. Yeah, uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised if if Biden just, you know, said something crazy, one of his gaffes when he was speaking to, to these guys, which actually came out as a truth. So yeah. he misspoke as Biden usually does. Absolutely. But he admitted a truth. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if it freaked them out because they were probably yeah. like, what's this guy saying? And Biden, you know, probably doesn't even realize himself that he that he messed up. You know, he just probably got angry about something and said some some truth like Ukraine will never win this war. And, you know, Estonia and Latvia, Lithuania were probably like, what? What did you say? And, you know, he's, uh, something like that probably happened. Uh, uh, that That's my feeling. Yeah. That, that's my I, feeling I, I, there. I and, agree. Um, I agree. I agree with that completely, yeah. by the way. Yeah. And what you just said takes us back to Debatsovo. What you just said about Olaf Schultz perhaps going to Washington and they're trying to find a peace plan would would lead me to believe that maybe, maybe they're going to say, you know what, Olaf, get in contact with, with Putin or get someone to get in contact with Putin before these 10,000 troops, something happens to, to them and try to float, float out an, an idea, a, a negotiation, something. Yeah. Possibly. I mean, they're obviously panicked. They're obviously worried. Yes. yes. I mean, that is very much the impression I'm getting. But um, it's very difficult to see what they can come up with. And what Schultz was saying, you know, the Russians was pulled out of Ukraine. I mean, he's talking all the usual cliches. I mean, this isn't really setting up positions for a negotiation, as far as I can tell. But it may very well be that that's what they're talking about. And as I said, I mean, it's interesting that the media wasn't brought along. And we discussed in our previous video, when we discussed his visit, the, his visit, why that might have been avoiding awkward questions about Nord Stream and things like that, which are good reasons. But it may be that also they don't want to disclose anything about their negotiation strategy. The problem with Biden, and to close out the video, I want to get your opinion on this because I've been thinking about this uh, a little bit. The problem with Biden right now, the Biden White House, is that they're about to enter an election cycle. I mean, it's right around the corner. And if Biden, Biden has two options, in my opinion. Either he continues to, to double and triple down in Ukraine and go for the win, go for some sort of victory, whatever that is. But even a victory would mean some sort of U.S presence in Ukraine, which is not going to go over well with the American public as he enters an election cycle. This is, of course, under the assumption that Biden is running, which I believe he is going to run. That's I think he's set on running. Um, or his other option is to try to find a way to get out of this and to position himself as the candidate who found a peaceful solution to Ukraine. I, mean, I don't know what's your thoughts on this because I'm I'm trying to now frame this from the perspective of a Democrat party and a Biden White House that in the next couple of months is going to have to be in campaign mode and I don't think they could afford another Afghanistan type of debacle and this would be magnitudes greater than Afghanistan so either they better get a win or get something that they can frame as a victory or he better find another solution that he can walk away from and present it to the American people as a positive. Well, indeed. I mean, you know, the, the, the obvious parallel to this is what Richard Nixon did over, over Vietnam, which is that he came to a peace agreement with the North Vietnamese in Paris. I believe that was in 1972-73. He then claimed that he'd achieved peace with honour. He then ran for re-election in 74 and won by a landslide 
though, of course, he was also uh, did all sorts of unnecessary things like the Watergate burglary, but we're not going to worry about that. But anyway, he, he, he won as the man who you know, achieved peace with honour in Vietnam. And then, of course, the next year, uh, South Vietnam collapsed. <laughs> so it could very well be that this is, you know, this, but, but at least it got him over the election finishing line, if you like. And I, I don't think anybody in Washington apart from perhaps a few fervid people, seriously believes that Ukraine is going to win this war anymore. I mean, I don't think, you know, maybe Victoria Nuland thinks it, but she's probably the last person. I get the sense that even, even uh, Blinken and Sullivan are probably coming close now to the point where they realise this really isn't, an ex this isn't working. And um, uh, they're the latest Pentagon arms delivery to Ukraine was, I mean, Brian Boletic has broken it down really well. It was derisory. I mean, he, the, lot, you, we're going to supply 155 millimeter ammunition. We don't have, they don't tell us how much, it, how much 105 millimeter ammunition. Again, they don't tell us how much. And it's right the way through. And it, it tells us now that they you know, the cupboard there is bare. And you sense the Pentagon is putting his foot down. So better some kind of thing that you could sell as peace with honour rather than the total debacle of a, of a collapse in Ukraine, which would take down not just Biden, but the entire Democratic Party with him. So, I, you know, I, I can see the logic of this. But, of course, the Russians have to agree and one wonders why they would at this point. I mean, you know, I, at the very least, I would have thought that they would demand very, very tough terms. I mean, the four regions, at the very least, Kherson, Zaporozhye, the two Donbass republics, at the very least. There's been talk of a demilitarized zone, which, is good, which would include Kharkov, and Kiev, east of the um, Dnieper. I mean, it would be a very, very hard bargain that the Russians would drive. Why wouldn't they? What do you think, Biden? I mean, do you think Biden is is in an, is going to have to start looking at this from the lens of an election cycle? Well, yes. Or the Biden I mean, White House? If, Once again, if, if he is running. If he is running. Well, well, even if he's not running, I mean, I think that Biden is a fervid Democrat, whatever else he is. I mean, it's the one thing he will want the Democrats to win. At the very least, he wants them to win because, well, to be straightforward about it, he doesn't want he, himself and his family investigated if there's a Republican president and a Republican attorney general and a Republican Congress in, in, you know, in place. Um, in 2024, 2025. So he will want to debt the Democrats at least to avoid a wipeout and hopefully to retain the White House and to at least retain some strength in Congress. And that's whether he decides to run himself or not. Like yourself, by the way, I think he, he does want to run himself. And one of the reasons he wants to run himself is because he probably feels he's in a stronger position to parry those investigations as president than he does if he's not president. So he's got all of these factors now bubbling underneath him. And that does suggest, given that Ukraine isn't going to win, and, you know, his meeting with the East Europeans suggests that that's what he deep down thinks. That does suggest that he wants to find some way out. That, that would be a reason to think, you know, he wanted to find some way out. But, of course, he's an ideologue. He's a neocon. He's surrounded by neocons. He's made some extraordinary statements over the course of this war. Um, he must know that any deal with the Russians will be very tough, very difficult to negotiate. The Russians, as I said, will drive a very hard bargain. And it might be a hard sell. 
and it'll be a very hard sell in Eastern Europe, not to mention Ukraine. Very hard sell. All right. Uh, the Durad.locals.com. We are on Rockfin as well. And go to the Durad shop, 10% off. Use the code. Good day. Take care.